you got your Bibles with you, we're going to be in 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 13 today. First Corinthians 13, and we're actually going to start in chapter 12. I'm going to start reading in chapter 12, verse 31, and then we will read chapter 13 in its entirety. So First Corinthians chapter 12, starting in verse 31, please hear this public reading of God's Word. But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. <clears throat> if I speak in the tongues of men and of angels... But have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. <clears throat> for we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three, but the greatest of these is love. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, it is a privilege to gather here and to worship with your people, a privilege to sing, a privilege to open your word up and to hear it read from. And Father, we have a privilege today of coming to a very familiar and powerful passage in 1 Corinthians 13. But again, Father, I pray when we come to a familiar passage, we may be tempted to drift away because we think we understand it or know it well, but Father, I pray that the familiarity of this passage would not cause us to zone out, but I pray that you would help us to zone in, help us to be attentive to this passage, open up our eyes to see wondrous things from this passage. And Father, we simply don't want to just acquire knowledge about love today. We want to come away from today loving others more fully, more completely, more constantly in our lives. So Father, we would pray that you would help us to apply this passage to our lives. Help us to love more biblically in our lives. Father, we pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we come to a very familiar passage today in 1 Corinthians 13. Uh, it may be one of the most familiar passages or most familiar passages or chapters in the entire New Testament. And it's very well known. It is You've probably heard it read at weddings before, but let me just give you a flavor of what some of the commentators said about this passage. They said that chapter 13 is beautifully written. The chapter is a masterpiece. It is one of the most beloved passages in the Bible. 1 Corinthians 13 is a passage of singular beauty and power. All those things are true. I think we would agree with those things. But I think one thing that we need to remember before we dive into 1 Corinthians 13 is we need to remember the context in which it was written. Paul wrote this chapter or this section of 1 Corinthians 13 to the Corinthian believers. And he inserts this section on love intentionally right after he's finished speaking on spiritual gifts. And right before he talks about prophecy and tongues, he inserts this section about love intentionally to them because what he wants to do is he's giving them actually a gentle rebuke or maybe a strong rebuke. He's doing this lovingly, but he's rebuking the Corinthian believers, and he wants to show them that the fundamental indication of spiritual maturity is not gifts. That's not the fundamental indication of spiritual maturity. The fundamental indicator of spiritual maturity is love. It is love, and so he wants to show them that this is the fundamental indication is love. So he's rebuking the Corinthian believers, He's using this chapter to cut them down to size, to humble them, because he wants to show them what really 
matters to God. So we need to remember the context in which it was written. The second thing I would say is that when we come to study this chapter, we come to chew on 1 Corinthians 13, we're going to find out that these words are going to cut us down to size. They're going to humble us as we see what really matters to God, and that is love is the essential thing. So now let's start at the end of chapter 12, verse 31. Before we get to 13, I want to talk about verse 31, which Mark ended on last Sunday. Verse 31 says, But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. You remember Mark talked about how we should earnestly desire the higher gifts. If we are lacking in wisdom, we should pray. Go to the throne of grace and ask God to give us wisdom. We should ask God to help us use our gift more fully for His glory, for the good of the body. Or if there's an area that we want to grow in in the local church, perhaps servant-hearted, self-sacrificial servant-hearted humility in the church, we can pray, God, make me more humble, more servant-hearted in the way that I serve the body. We should do that. But notice Paul says, and I will show you a still more excellent way, which this still more excellent way is chapter 13. It is the way of love is the more excellent way that Paul is about to spell out. So yes, earnestly desire the higher gifts, yet there is something higher than the greatest of all these gifts, and this is within the reach of the humblest and most ordinary believer, which is the way of love, which is the more excellent way. One last thing of introduction, this word love that Paul uses in chapter 13 is the well-known word agape, and this word is rooted in the notion of care, regard, respect for the other, and for the well-being of the other. Just so we have an idea of what this word means, care, regard, respect for the other, and for the well-being of the other. There's going to be three basic points today. Verses 1 to 3, we're going to look at the prominence of love Point two, verses four to seven, we're going to look at the characteristics of love. There are 15 characteristics of love jam-packed in verses four to seven. That's where we will spend most of our time. And then eight to 13 is the permanence of love. Love never ends. So the prominence of love, let's look at verse one of chapter 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. So you see what Paul is saying here. The best speech of earth or of heaven without love is noise. It's a noisy nuisance. The greatest speech of earth or heaven, he may be even using hyperbole here, the tongues of angels, if that is given without love, it is noisy nuisance. So no matter how exalted our gift of teaching may be, no matter how spectacular our gift to communicate the gospel is without love, we are nothing more than a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. Alistair Begg said that we may be very gifted with our speech. We may be able to make cogent arguments. We may be able to speak helpfully to our colleagues and neighbors about the things of Jesus. We may be able to defend our faith powerfully, but when love is missing, we might as well bang away on a gong when love is absent. And Begg said that he was going to have a gong up on stage. He was going to have a cymbal up on stage. He was going to hire a guy to come up and just pound away on the gong and on the cymbal. He said it wouldn't take very long to drive everybody absolutely bonkers. Everybody would go nuts. Now, if my son was here, he'd want to come up and join in this guy. Give me that mallet. I'll show you how it's done and pound away on the gong. But you see, it would be a noisy nuisance to us. Just a few minutes of that, and we'd want to leave the room, or we'd want to make him stop, because that's the point that Paul is trying to press home here. If Our giftedness in speech is very great, is incredible, but if we don't have love, we are a noisy nuisance, just banging away on a gong. So if our gift of speaking and teaching is not undergirded and infused with love, it is just noise. So I'll say it like this for everyone who's helped on the panel back there at Sunday school. Or if you have helped teach on Tuesday nights at our church, or for all the other elders who speak and do what I am doing right here, for everybody who helps in book clubs, leading book clubs, if you help lead Bible studies at our church, I'm thinking bro Bible study guys who help teach the Word. If you are involved in discipleship settings where you are trying to do spiritual good to other Christians, and if you like to write blogs and write on social media about the things of God, if our speaking, if our teaching, if our discipleship, if our writing and typing is not undergirded and infused with love, we are a noisy gong banging away on a cymbal without 
love. So you see, this must have shocked the Corinthian believers right out of the gate because they were exalting themselves because of their gift of tongues. One thing we can pull from this, we can apply what Paul is saying here to whatever spiritual gift God has given you or gifts that God has given you, whatever role we play in the church, whether it is preaching or teaching or serving or giving or administration or hospitality or encouragement or whatever it is, whatever the gift, love is the essential thing. We've got to see that love is the essential thing. Again, Beck says, I don't care what gift you have. I don't care how good you are at using it. I don't care how many people are impressed with it. If you don't have love, you are a noisy nuisance. This is a sobering thought to think about. We have to have love. Love is the essential thing to our giftedness. Verse 2, and if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. I am nothing. D.A. Carson says this. He says if Paul were addressing the modern church, perhaps he would expand a little bit further and say this, you Christians who prove your spirituality by the amount of theological information you can cram into your heads, I tell you that such knowledge by itself proves nothing. One thing I love about our church is our church is filled with people who love theology, who love doctrine, who love to talk about the Bible and the things of God. I remember at our second retreat, I think it was the gospel at work was the title of that retreat. You may have been there. Mark opened us up that night and he had 17 points. You may have been there. You remember that. Mark had 17 points. That's about five of my dad's sermons packed into one message, 17 points. And after his message, a powerful message, gospel at work, long after we got done singing, people were still in that main room sitting at the tables with their Bibles out and they were talking about the things of God. And I saw the people talking and it made me glad. It caused me to rejoice. I was so excited to see that people were still talking about the things of God long after the message had been given. So I love this about our church, that our church loves theology, but we must remember that th knowledge must always lead to love. It must always lead to love. We must remember that our theological knowledge means nothing before God if it causes us to look down our noses at people with self-righteousness. Our theological knowledge means nothing before God if it simply causes us to be puffed up with pride. It means nothing. If that's all it's doing is it's filling us up with pride. It means nothing. So knowledge devoid of love is nothing. I'll tell a quick story to illustrate this. Many of you know Vodi Bakum was a powerful preacher of the gospel. He grew up in South Central Los Angeles, gang infested South Central Los Angeles. His mom was a teenager when she gave birth to him, and she was a Buddhist. So all his upbringing, he never heard the gospel until he went off to college. I think he had a football scholarship. And in college, he heard the gospel, and I believe he became a Christian soon after hearing the gospel for the first time. He's powerfully converted. And I'm not 100% sure if it was Mormons or Jehovah's Witnesses who came to his dorm room. I think it was Mormons. Well, say it was Mormons. They came to his dorm room after he was a Christian, and he wasn't able to defend his faith adequately in this moment. He wasn't able to argue well enough against them. He didn't know enough about Mormonism. And after they left, he was determined that he was going to study Mormonism. He was going to be ready and prepared and armed when they returned. So he studied and he studied and he studied and he prepared and he prepared and he prepared and he was ready. And, you know, weeks later they showed up again and he was ready. He was armed with his arguments and he shot his arguments out and they were not able to withstand his arguments. And he sort of left them cowering away as they walked away, you know, tail tucked between their legs as they left. And he is feeling proud of himself that he has defeated them, and he said it was a Christian friend of his turned to him and rebuked him with one sentence with this question. He said, Vodi, do you think they'll ever come back? And he said that's all he had to say because he knew the answer was no. You see, Vodi had gotten all of this theological knowledge, but he got it to win an argument. He hadn't given it in love. That type of knowledge means nothing. It is nothing before God. So are we zealous to proclaim the gospel and defend the truth because we simply like to win arguments or are we motivated primarily by love for lost people? J.I. Packer says, what do I intend to do with my theological knowledge about God once I have it? That is the question. 
What am I going to do with this knowledge once I have it? If we pursue theological knowledge for its own sake, it is bound to go bad on us. It is guaranteed to go bad on us. It will fill us with pride and self-righteousness. So what are we doing with the theological knowledge that we gain? Even today, I hope we don't simply want to know some more facts about love. I hope we will want to love others more fully today. And then Paul even says there at the end of 2, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains but have not love, I am nothing. Even one who has the gift of faith of such outstanding confidence in the way, ways of God without love is also nothing. Verse 3, if I give away all I have and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So in verses 1 and 2, we see that love infuses what we say and what we know with meaning. It also is going to give meaning to what we do. Love is going to give meaning to what we do as well. And it is sobering to reflect that one may be generous to the point of beggary and yet completely lacking in love. We could give away everything we have, but we could do it from a wrong motive. We could do it without having love to whoever we are giving away this money. And not only that, he says middle of verse 3, and if I deliver up my body to be burned but have not love, I gain nothing. So we can see that self-sacrifice can be self-seeking. Here's what Paul's getting at. And certainly, if that applies to something as extreme as death, it must also apply to lesser acts of sacrifice. Lesser acts of sacrifice we make could be a selfish form of attention-seeking. So in verses 1 to 3, we see the prominence of love. Love is the essential thing. Now we're going to look at characteristics of love in verses 4 to 7. Beginning of verse 4, love is patient. Love is patient. Or you could say love is long-suffering. Love is long-suffering. This word usually suggests not merely willingness to wait a long time. Certainly it includes that. Or endurance of suffering without giving way, but endurance of injuries without Retaliation, that's the idea here. Endurance of injuries without retaliation. Love is long-suffering. Love is patient. Love will put up with many slights and neglects from the person it loves. So love is patient. That's the first thing we see. Secondly, love is patient and kind. Love is kind. Again, verse 4, love is kind. Love will spend itself on others. Love is warm and tender-hearted towards one another. So love is kind. Love is not merely patient or long-suffering in the face of injury, but love is quick to pay back with kindness what it received in hurt. Love reacts with goodness towards those who ill-treat it. It gives itself in kindness in the service of others. Quick story on this comes from the life of St. Augustine. Many of you may know St. Augustine, a famous Christian of many, many years ago, and he wrote a famous book called The Confessions. And in that book, he told sort of his story. If you know St. Augustine, you know that he had a very godly mother named Monica who never stopped praying that Augustine would come to saving faith. She prayed, and she prayed, and she prayed. She pled with God to save her son. And Augustine lived a very sinful life for a long time, into his 30s, I believe, living a very sinful life. But his godly mother is pleading and praying that God would save him. And then Augustine went to Milan, and in Milan he heard a famous preacher, perhaps the most famous preacher of the day, Bishop Ambrose preach, and I want you to hear what he says about this famous preacher, about meeting him. Ambrose told me how glad he was that I had come to see him. My heart warmed to him, not at first as a teacher of the truth, but simply as a man who was kind to me. That man of God received me like a father. Unknown to me, it was you, Lord, who led me to him so that I might be led by him to you. So under the sovereignty of God, you have the prayers of his godly mother, and you have the kindness of Bishop Ambrose, who was kind to him, who was kind to him like a father, received him like a father. Love is kind. Love is patient and kind. One pastor said, one of the greatest challenges with our families is to be kind to each other. I mean, just think about the context of the home, how we receive one sharp comment from, from somebody in our home, and how quickly we are to retaliate with another sharp comment. How quickly are we to not behave like the way of love of 1 Corinthians 13? Love is long-suffering. Love endures the sharp comment, and then love responds in kindness to that sharp 
comment coming from the other person. That is the way of love of 1 Corinthians 13. So love is patient and kind. Again, verse 4, now love does not envy. Love does not envy. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. Go back here to patience and kindness. Uh, I've got to ask this question. How do we cultivate a type of love that is both patient and kind? How are we going to cultivate this type of love that is both patient and kind? And I love what one commentator said. He said, Paul's description of love begins with this twofold description of God, who through Christ has shown himself forbearing and kind toward those who deserve divine judgment. The obvious implication, of course, is that this is how his people are to be towards others. So harshness and severity and meanness are contrary to love, especially given God's kindness in Christ Jesus to sinners. So we're going to cultivate this by remembering God's patience and kindness to us. Both, two, two pastors told this same story about an atheist who was well known in the 1800s. And this particular atheist used to do this stunt where he would get up in front of people and he would say that he was going to give God five minutes to kill him for all the things he'd said against God. And he would set his watch for five minutes and he would continue talking. You know, I'm giving God five minutes. And after the five minutes were up, he would say, see, God doesn't exist. He hasn't struck me dead for all the things I have done and said against him. One well-known Christian of the day was told about this particular stunt by this atheist, asked him what he thought of it, and this Christian man said, did he really believe he could exhaust the patience of God in five minutes? No, he could not exhaust the patience of God. Praise God for his patience towards sinners. Second Peter 3, 9, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but that all should reach repentance. We must remember the patience and kindness of God. One pastor said, the prodigal son story illustrates the patience of God. I had never really thought about this before he said that. I think it illustrates the patience and kindness of God. You know the prodigal son story, famous story. Remember the younger brother, the prodigal son, he comes to the father, he wants his inheritance, he wants it now. I don't want you, dad, I want your inheritance, I want your gifts So give me my inheritance. The father gives him his inheritance. He goes to a faraway land. He squanders it. He wastes it away, extravagant living in a faraway land. But then quickly he runs out of money and a famine arises in the land. And all of a sudden he gets a job feeding the pigs. And he's begging to be fed with the pods that the pigs are eating. But this pastor said that the father in the prodigal son story was patient. He was exceedingly patient. He waits, and he waits, and he waits. When everybody else has given up, and when other people have turned to bitterness, his arms are open to receive the son when he comes home, no matter what he has done. And I was reflecting on the patience of the father in the prodigal son's door, and I picture him running out and looking for his son. Is he coming home? And racing day by day to see, is my son coming home? the patience of the father. The son comes to his senses. He repents of his sin. He turns and he makes the long journey home and he's practicing up his speech to the father. And then the father sees him when he was a long way off and he races to him. He embarrasses himself. He lovingly embraces the son. He kisses the son. The son can't even get his speech, all of his speech out of his mouth. And he says, the father says, bring quickly the best robe and put it on and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fattened calf and kill it. And let us eat and celebrate for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found and they began to celebrate the patience of the Father. We should remember the patience of God towards us. But in that story, we have the kindness of God. John Newton, who I've mentioned many times, was converted in the middle of that storm. But I didn't know this until recently, that after his conversion, there was a Bible on board that ship, and he got the Bible, and he began to read it. It was the captain's Bible, and he came to Luke 15, and he read the prodigal son, perhaps for the first time in his life, and he related with the prodigal son. He saw himself in the prodigal son, because he was an exceedingly vile sinner in his own words. He saw himself, and he said he was stunned by the kindness of the father in the prodigal son story. So we are going to begin to cultivate love that is both patient and kind when we remember the patience and kindness of God towards us. Okay, now love does not envy. 
is the next portion. Love does not envy. So love does not allow fellow believers to be in rivalry or competition. Love will ask this question in the context of the local church, how best do I serve those for whom Christ died? I love that question. How best do I serve those for whom Christ died? So love does not envy. Next, love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. So love is not arrogant. Love does not boast. It is not possible to boast and to love at the same time. We cannot boast and love at the same time. One commentator pointed to Proverbs 27 2. He said that catches what Paul has in mind, which says, let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider and not your own lips. There are lots and lots of ways of manifesting pride But love is incompatible with every single one of those ways where pride can be manifest itself. Love is concerned to give itself, not to assert itself. Love looks to praise others, especially in the body of Christ. Love looks to praise those around it and not to praise oneself. Two examples on this topic of arrogance and boasting. One's a negative example. I got this from a pastor who got it from a book. I think it's from another pastor who says this. I clearly remember a missionary evangelist who came into my home along with others for dinner. For three hours, he never stopped talking about himself, his ministries, his success. He told us how far, how hard he had worked, how far and wide he had traveled, how blessed he was of God. Not once, however, during the long evening meal did he inquire of others at the table. He was a boaster. Now, it's dangerous to share a quote like that because it could go wrong. Many of you could be hearing that and thinking, yeah, I know people like that. I've been in situations like that where other people didn't inquire of me, but that's not my intention of sharing that quote. My intention was to sort of examine ourselves to see if we see some of that man's behavior in us. Do we always turn the conversation back to ourselves? Do we always tend to talk about ourselves, or do we, out of love, inquire of others? Second story, a positive example, comes from back in 1966, The man named Doug Nichols was working for a mission organization called Operation Mobilization, and he was stationed in London. They were getting ready for their big annual conference that year, and he was assigned to the cleanup crew. It was after midnight. He's out cleaning the front steps of this conference center area, and that's when an elderly gentleman approached him. He was dressed very simply. He had a small bag with him. And the man asked Doug Nichols if this is where the conference was being held. The man said, yes, it was. This man said, well, I'm attending the conference. Is there any place that I could perhaps stay? Doug said that most of the people had gone to bed for the night, but he said he was going to see what he could do. He led him into a large room where there were about 50 people were bunked down on the floor, you know, sleeping in sleeping bags and mattresses, whatnot, on the floor. This man didn't have anything to sleep on, so Doug searched around. He found some padding. He found a blanket. He wasn't even able to find a pillow. He gave him a towel to use as a pillow. The man said that would be just fine and that he appreciated it very much. Doug asked the man if he'd had anything to eat for dinner. He said he hadn't, so they went into the pantry area. Doug found some cornflakes, some cereal, and some toast. He poured him this cereal, gave him some toast. They enjoyed some conversation together in the kitchen, and then they went to bed on the floor next to each other in that room. The next morning, Doug awakened to find out that he was in big trouble the next morning. The conference leaders came to him and said, don't you know who it was that you put on the floor last night? And Doug didn't know who it was that, they had, that he had put on the floor. That's Francis Schaefer. He's the speaker for this conference. We had a whole room set aside for him. Doug had no idea that he was sleeping on the floor next to a celebrity that he had told a man to sleep on the floor who had a profoundly important ministry. He had no idea that this man had helped shape the Christian church of that day and really the church of our day. And Schaefer never let on. In humility, he had accepted his lot and been grateful for it. You see, love is humble. Love is not proud. Love does not boast. Love is not arrogant. Love is humble. You see, Francis Schaefer could have come in there saying, I'm the main speaker. I'm a well-known Christian. I'm not sleeping on the floor. But Francis Schaeffer showed love and humility. He was genuinely grateful for the kindness of Doug Nichols to him and genuinely grateful to sleep on the floor. Beginning of verse 5, love is not rude. Just a quick comment on that. Love does not behave improperly toward others. Love always takes into consideration how someone else is going to feel, how they're going to respond. 
Next, verse 5 again, it does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. So we see that love is not self-absorbed. Love is not self-obsessed. And it's not irritable. Love is not irritable. That one little phrase, irritable. I mean, just think about this past week. How many times have we been irritable this week? But love is not irritable. And then he ends by saying love is not resentful. And there's a note there, maybe in your Bible, that says Greek irritable and does not count up wrongdoing. So I love the NIV translation of this end of this verse. The NIV says it keeps no record of wrongs. Love keeps no record of wrongs. Many of you may have seen the movie A Christmas Carol and Ebenezer Scrooge, the famous character, and he's in his office. He's got a candlelight and he's writing down, keeping very careful notes. What is he doing? He's keeping very careful track of what people owe him. But you see, that is not the way of love. Love does not keep careful record of wrongs received. And how often are we tempted to do this? This person wronged me on this day. This person wronged me there. And we hold it, and then we will try to hold it against somebody later. You said that you did this to me. But that's not the way of love. Love receives it. It's like a spark falling into the ocean, and love consumes it. Love forgives time and again and again and again. Where love has invaded a life, where love has invaded a church, it will not be filled with people who love to store in their memory bank their record of wrongs received. And certainly, Jesus and Stephen both demonstrated this type of love by forgiving the people who put them to death. Verse 6, love does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Sadly, it is all too characteristic of human nature to take pleasure in the misfortunes of others, but love takes no joy in evil of any kind. Rather, it rejoices with the truth. If there is any report of something right or truthful going on, love will quickly rejoice over it. Love takes delight when righteousness flourishes and advances. Barnabas illustrates what Paul refers to here when he traveled to Syrian Antioch and saw that many were converted by God's grace. He was glad. Acts eleven twenty three. 23, the righteous rejoice in the progress of of the gospel. I hope we rejoice when the gospel advances. I hope we rejoice when people are brought to saving faith. I hope we rejoice when righteousness flourishes and advances. What we rejoice in is an indication of what our hearts really cherish. Verse 7, love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love bears all things. Because of sin, there is always going to be things in others for us to bear. Their behavior is going to test our patience, and our behavior is going to test theirs. So we see that love is going to require effort. Love is hardworking. Love believes all things. It doesn't mean that love is gullible, but love prefers to be generous in its openness and acceptance rather than suspicious or cynical. You could paraphrase by saying, love gives the benefit of the doubt. And lastly, love endures all things. Love hopes for the best and is always ready to give an offender a second chance. This doesn't mean that we have to suffer quietly every injustice that comes our way, but it means that we keep loving even when it's hard. So Christian love is more than sentimentality. It is courageous. It is hardworking. And one commentator put this question. He said, how much hard work is required by persistent, unselfish habits of love. Last point, we're going to look at the permanence of love, verses 8 to 13. Let me just read those for us. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide these three, but the greatest of these is love. We see the permanence of love. Love is never going to end. It will remain the interpersonal currency of heaven. So there's all kinds of different disagreement on this passage. 
But I think everyone would agree with this, this basic idea of what Paul is trying to get across. The basic idea is that these gifts that Paul is talking about, they are temporary. They are fleeting. They are going away. Love is eternal. Love is the thing that is going to last forever. One commentator said, This present phase of our existence is to that coming perfection as childhood is to maturity. The Corinthians must recognize that the things to which they attach paramount importance were the transient concerns of spiritual immaturity and learn to set the highest value on the things that endure forever. So we better concentrate on what really matters. We better focus in on what matters, what is going to endure, and that is love. That's where we've got to give our attention and effort is love, cultivating love for others. So as a quick reminder, summary here, the first three verses, we saw the the importance of love, the prominence of love. My dad preached a sermon on this. His title was everything minus love equals nothing. And that's the idea of the first three verses. Everything minus love equals nothing. It doesn't matter our giftedness. It doesn't matter how powerfully we are gifted to teach or to serve. If we don't have love, we're a noisy gong. It profits us nothing. And then we see the characteristics of love, which we would do well to Marinate on verses 4 to 7, 15 characteristics of love to pray over and to try to apply to pray that God would help us to live out those characteristics of love. And lastly, love never ends. Love never ends. So as we think about chapter 13, none of us lives like this constantly, fully, every day. We don't even come close to living like this constantly and fully every day. So again, the question is, how do we make progress here, how do we cultivate this type of love? Well, remember, we remember the patience of God and the kindness of God. You remember the prodigal son story again. You remember the father racing out to the son, and he lovingly embraces the son. He kisses him. He rejoices. They celebrate when the son returns. Well, how can God lovingly embrace sinners? How can God do that? Well, Greg already If you were paying attention, Greg already powerfully talked about this earlier in his confession. How can God embrace us lovingly? Well, because God, out of love for the world, sent his son into the world to save sinners. He sent his son to save sinners. And you see that Jesus was the only person who lived this way perfectly, fully, every day, every second of his life. He lived the way of love his entire life the way of 1 Corinthians 13. He went around doing good. He went around loving people in this way his whole life. But you come to the end of his life, you see him battered and beaten and bloodied. You see him carrying a cross that he cannot carry because he is so weak. You see him crumbling to the ground, and then you see him crucified between two thieves. And you see him forsaken of God. You see, he who knew no sin, we see him becoming sin. For us, so that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. You see, this is how God can lovingly embrace a sinner who has genuinely repented because of Jesus and His perfect life and His sacrificial death on the cross on our behalf. So maybe our lack of love in our life reveals how little we dwell on the loving kindness of God towards us. Maybe it reveals how far we have wandered away from the cross. And we must come back to the cross and behold the love of God, the love of Christ for us. And that will help us cultivate this type of love of 1 Corinthians 13. One commentator said, Christians thought of love as that quality we see on the cross. It is a love for the utterly unworthy, a love that proceeds from a God who is love. It is a love lavished on others without a thought whether they are worthy or not. The Christian who has experienced God's love for him while he was yet a sinner, has been transformed by the experience. So we have the joy of celebrating communion today. So if you just flip back to chapter 11 of 1 Corinthians, and I will read verses 23 to 28 of 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians 11, starting in verse 23. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until He comes. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then, and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. So if you're not a Christian here today, we would ask you to abstain from coming down. We'd ask you not to partake of the elements. You see, you don't need the symbol. You need the substance. You need what this points to. You need the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you remember the prodigal son, you may feel conviction. You haven't led the life of 1 Corinthians 13, but I would say if you would repent, if you turn from your sins and trust, rest in the finished work of Jesus, you can be forgiven and have new life in Christ. But for all who are believers in Jesus here today, and if you're not living in unrepentant sin, if you're not at odds with another believer in the body, we would invite you, after examining yourself, we would invite you to come and partake of the elements. Just please cup your hand as you go back to your seat, and we take communion sitting down because we are resting in the finished work of Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, 1 Corinthians 13 is a, is a challenging, extremely challenging chapter. It is a convicting chapter because we see our sin being revealed on those pages. We see how far short we fall from failing to love in that way, in this biblical way. Father, forgive us for our impatience. Forgive us for our lack of kindness. Forgive us for our pride, for our boasting, for our irritability. And we could go on and on. Forgive us for our lack of love. But Father, help us to be quick to remember your patience, your kindness, your love for us. Help us to be quick to race to the cross and see Jesus suffering in our place. And Father, I pray that we would come sorrowful for sin and repenting of our lack of love. But I pray that we would return from taking communion rejoicing at the finished work of Jesus Christ. I pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.